He said, preacher, they'll get you this week. Nope, I'm leaving this week. Going to be gone. Uh, we got an anniversary this week. We're going to head out of town. Brother Auger is going to be uh, preaching for you on Wednesday night. I'm going to uh, take my bride of 40 year, 44 years, rather, 44. Got to get all the fours in there. 44 years. We're going to get away for a few days. But we'll be back on, on Friday, amen? And so we're going to slip out just a little bit on you. Take your Bibles and turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. If you would, please stand for the reading of God's Word if you're able to. Hebrews chapter 12. It's a very familiar scripture. Really just a reminder of some things that we need to remember in our hearts and lives. You know, m many of you have been in church for years. You've heard message after message out of many of these verses. But sometimes what we need is just to, re, to, to be reminded. And just uh, think again upon God's Word. It's rich from cover to cover. And it doesn't matter how many times you've read it. It doesn't matter how many times you've heard it preached. God's Word is fresh and it's real and it's alive. And, and God wants it to, to touch our hearts and wants our hearts to be stirred by His Word. His Word is, is precious. And oh, how we need to, to take it into our hearts and lives. Hebrews chapter 12, beginning reading verse 1, we read down through verse 3. It says, Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the, of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradictions of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. There in verse 2 it says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before us, or set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. I'd like to preach the message of Tyler, the one I'm looking to. Let's pray. Father, we come to you and realize, Lord, great is thy salvation. Our eyes many times go to so many different things. Lord, I pray that we look unto you, who is the author and finisher of our faith. May we magnify you with our lives. May we live for you. May we run this race that's set before us in such a way that you're honored and glorified in every step that we take. Have your will and way, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You be seated. Paul describes life in, in verse 1 here at, as a race that is set before us. Each of us are in this race. We find there in the, in the second part of verse 1, he says, Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. You're in a race. You're in this race of life that we call it. And there is a goal, and that goal is Jesus Christ. And we're to keep our eyes upon Him. In every race, there, uh, there has to be a starting line. But in every race, there's a finish line also. And we need to realize that the race only lasts so long. I don't know about you, but I, 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 now John is. I'm not, I've never been much of a runner, and I've never been fast. Some of these guys up here, I've seen some of them run, and they're pretty fast. And uh, I've never been fast at running uh, unless uh, Janine was chasing me and I'm trying to get away from her. Amen? <laughs> and that's when I have to run, jump in the truck and take off driving. <laughs> but the fact is, is that uh, in a race, you want to set a pace. One that you can keep, one that you can endure, one that you can, can maintain. And it's the same way in your Christian life. God wants you to set a pace for Him and He wants you to run the race. He doesn't want you to quit. He doesn't want you to fall out. He doesn't want you to get to a place where you can't go on. Many times uh, you talk to different runners and like I said, John is a runner and, and uh, runs practically every day and, and uh, has for years. There's a place that in a race when you get that uh, they get, you get what they call a second breath. And that second breath is what pushes you over the top and keeps you going. You get to a place and it almost feels like I can't go any longer, then all of a sudden, if you're in shape, you get that second breath. And it's like shifting gears and you're able to go on and you're able to keep running. 
Uh, many times, I remember several years ago when uh, Bethany, our second daughter, she run a marathon. And it was a full marathon. And uh, I, John, what is a full marathon? Is it 20? How many? 26? 26.2. And so it's 26.2 miles that you run this thing. While she was training, she had a trainer that trained her. But he would never let her run over 20 miles. He said, that's as, that's as far as we will train. You will train for 20 miles. She said, well, what about the last six miles? He said, you just got to gut it out. He said, if I make you run the 26 miles, he said, you won't show up on marathon day. And so I remember uh, we went over to Cape, or not to Cape, but to uh, uh, Columbia, and, and she got in this marathon, and she run this marathon, and if I'd have known it, I'd have went down and, and run with her. Uh, I was walking at, time and, at that time, and I could have kept up with her maybe at that end of the race, uh, and I was, uh, I'd do a little bit of jogging at the same time. But uh, she got to that point, a little over the 20-mile mark, and she said it was terrible. In fact, when she crossed the finish line, she said, never again. <laughs> <laughs> and guess what? It's never been again. <laughs> but sometimes the race is one that we've got to look at in life and realize, hey, listen, we're in this race. It's not something that we can avoid. It's something that's before us. It's called life. But there is one that we can look unto who is that author and finisher of our faith. Life has a starting line, and it's easy to look at. It's easy to visualize in our lives uh, the starting line, but for some reason it's hard for us to visualize the finish line. That finish line is spoken of in Hebrews 9.27. says, as is a point unto men wants to die, but after this, the judgment that's the finish line. That is the finish line when we stand before the Lord. Whether it be if you're saved, it's going to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb, at the, at the, at the, at the, the beam of seat with Jesus Christ, as he hands out the awards and as he, as he uh, uh, reckons uh, how we've lived, we give an account of what we've done in this life and in this body, and we will stand before him. And, and, and 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. But there's also another judgment seat. It's called the white throne judgment, where all those who are lost at the end of that life, at that finish line, that is the finish line for them. And after, after that finish line, they will receive their rewards also, which will be a lake of fire forever and ever. Revelations 20 and verse 12 and 13 says, and I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. You find that they were cast into a lake of fire because they had rejected Jesus Christ as their Savior. That is the finish line. Every one of us have a starting line, but there is a finish line. So since there's a starting line there's a, and a finish line, there, we need to, uh, 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 to really consider some things. One is the race that's set before you. What is that race? What is that race? We find there in verse 1 it says, Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which has so easily beset us. And he says, And let us run with patience the race that's set before us. To run a race in life without Jesus Christ as your Savior will bring a terrible finish and a terrible cost. Back in the early 1900s, there was an evangelist that traveled the United States. His name was Tidwell. And he tells a story about a man that, uh, and I'm not sure whether it was down in, it must have been down in the south somewhere because they had the horse racing. This man raised ho uh, horses to race. He was involved in the horse racing uh, events and, and even within the gambling and all that went on those horses and all that took place wherever he was at. Well, he was holding, uh, Tidwell, uh, Evangelist Tidwell was holding this evangelistic meeting in this town and, and every night this man would come to the meeting. He was under deep conviction. God was dealing with his heart. He knew that he was lost. He knew that he needed to get saved. And after a while, each night he would get up and 
at the invitation time and come and kneel down and somebody would deal with him. But he would, he was, he would, he would pray and, and then he would say, not now. I, I can't, just not yet. Not yet. He'd get up and he would leave. The next night he'd come back and be under conviction of the preaching of, uh, of, uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of God uh, as, a, as Tidwell preached. And do the same thing. He'd say, not yet. I can't just yet. I just can't. And he'd get up and he'd walk out. And finally one night he came and he kneeled at the altar. And they heard him shout out, the colt and it all. The colt and it all. The colt and it all. And got up with a smile on his face. They said, what happened? He said, I received Christ my Savior. And the preacher looked at him. He said, can I ask you something? He said, yes. He said, what do you mean by the colt and it all? He said, I was willing to give up the horse racing and the gambling that went with the horse racing. He said, I was willing to sell all my race horses except for a colt. He said, this is going to be one of the fastest horses that there is. He said, I want to see him run just one time. He said, every time I go to the altar, he said, I was under conviction. No, I knew I needed to be saved, but I kept hanging on to that colt because I wanted to see that colt run. I wanted to see that colt win. He said, as long as I hung on to that colt, he said, I couldn't take a hold of Jesus Christ as my Savior. He said, tonight, he said, I gave the colt and it all to Jesus Christ. Amen. His racing in this world had changed. He no longer was racing horses, but he was racing. He was in the race for the Lord Jesus Christ to live for him and to magnify God and, and to be a testimony to others what God had done in his heart and life. The great need and it's for us to understand that there's a race set before us. And there's that finish line. I would hate to face the problems of this life without Jesus Christ. But every day people, they stumble through life without any hope. They stumble through this life, this race of life without any, without any help from the Lord in, in many respects because they will not receive Him as their Savior. In Isaiah 55 verse 6 says, Seek ye the Lord while He may be found. Call, upon, call ye upon Him while He is near. He said, listen, there's an opportunity for everyone to get saved. Can I say something tonight here that might be a little shocking thing to say on a Sunday night and with a good group of people that are faithful every week? Can I say this? There may be people in this room tonight that if you was to be honest and be truthful, you really don't know that you'd go to heaven. You might not be saved. You say, preacher, are you trying to to confuse us? No. The Bible says examine your hearts whether you be of the faith. Yeah. This life is a race that's going on and there's a finish line before you. It would be a terrible thing to, to go through life and think that the only thing about your race is, is going to church. It's more than that. Yeah. It's about a life that has been surrendered to Jesus Christ and receive Him as your Savior. See, preacher, does that happen very often? It happened to me. Professed to be saved when I was young. It wasn't until I was a sophomore in high school. And God was dealing with my heart and I was under conviction that I really realized and I understood that I was lost. I'd made a profession of faith as a, at, a, as a, at a younger age and supposedly made a profession of faith. I, I really, uh, somebody told me I got saved. I went forward in, in a service and, and knelt down and nobody really dealt with me. I got up and, and uh, they asked me, are, are you okay? And I said, sure, I'm fine. <laughs> and they come around and shook my hand. And I was lost as I could ever be. But it wasn't until the middle of May of 1975 on Wednesday night. The conviction got so heavy. And I decided that, hey, listen, I would sit with my friends, my girlfriend, and, and other friends. And, and I was supposed to be saved. I told people I was saved. And I thought, I'd always thought, what would people say? What will people think? What will they think if I tell them that I'm lost? And it kept rolling over my mind. You're going to go to hell. Does it really matter what people think? 
I came to that place where I realized I'm not going to hell for nobody. Amen. Got up and walked that aisle, received Christ my Savior that night. My friend, I'll tell you what, that's the greatest decision I ever made in my life. It changed, listen to me, it changed the finish line. It changed the finish line. It changed what's going to happen at the finish line. You know, what really matters is that finish line in a race. If you get in a race and you start running and you quit, you didn't make it all the way to the finish line. What matters is that finish line. But every one of us will cross a finish line one day. And what matters is how we've run that race and what the difference is in that race and what's going to make it matter is what we've done with Jesus Christ in our lives. No matter how hard you run in, in this race of life, if, you, if your hope is not in Jesus Christ, you've lost the race. Doesn't matter how well you run. This morning I spoke about, and I used as an illustration of Glenn Cunningham, who set the world record after he had been in a, in a fire as a, in a schoolhouse as a child, him and his brother, and his brother died, and, and how he was crippled, and it was months before he could even sit up straight, and then it was months before he could even stand up, and then he had to be, his legs were bent, and he, he couldn't do anything, so he had to take a chair and hang on to a chair and slide the chair around, and then finally he graduated to hanging on to the tail of the, of the family mule and, and, and walking by, hanging on to that, that, that tail of that family mule and then finally he graduated up to taking a hold, a hold of the tail of that, their, their colt there by the name of paint and he began to learn to, to gate with that horse a little bit and before long he was running the race. He set the world's record. In the mile. My friend, can I tell you, it doesn't matter how hard you run. doesn't matter how religious you talk. It doesn't matter how big your Bible is. It doesn't matter how many times you walk through that door. It doesn't matter how much money you put in the plate. And to be honest with you, it doesn't matter how many times you've been through that baptistry. If you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ... If you've never come to an end of yourself, if you've never come to a place where you admitted that you're a sinner on your way to a devil's hell and asked the Lord to forgive you of your sins and ask Him into your heart and life to be your Savior. Hey, listen, it doesn't matter if you've been raised in a Christian home. It doesn't matter if your dad is a preacher, a deacon, or whatever. It doesn't matter. The only thing is, hey, it doesn't matter how, how hard you run that race. What matters is what you did with Jesus Christ in your heart. Sometimes... In those situations where your family's in church all the time, sometimes it's a little harder. You've been raised up in it. Make sure you know Jesus Christ is your Savior. Also to neglect Jesus Christ in your race as a Christian after you've been saved. If you neglect Him, it's, a wa it's wasted and it's vain. The race that you run is it, 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 you're missing out what God has for you. Look there in verse 3 of, of Hebrews 2. It says, How shall we escape... Uh, Hebrews chapter 2, I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 3 says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? How shall we escape? That was written to the Christian. He said, If you neglect your salvation, how are you going to escape? And in fact, it's in vain if, if we don't live for the Lord, if we, if we don't serve the Lord, if we don't run this race for the Lord uh, uh, before us. Far too many Christians get sidetracked in the and sidelined in this race by sin and, and the things of this world. They get into the materialism. They get into the worldliness. They get into the sinful habits, the lust. They get into the apathy. They get into the selfishness and self-centeredness. And before long, their, their race is not about the Lord. Their race is about themselves, about things. And they forgot who's at the end. They forgot that they're to keep their eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 John 1, 
or I'm sorry, in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the, the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. The world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. The things of this world would need to lay them aside. There are weights that weight us down. Can I ask you, what is your life doing for the Lord Jesus Christ? Too many times we get weighted down with the things of this world. Come here, Levi. Now, I can do this pretty easy right now, can't I? Now, don't get too stiff on me. I'm going to bend you a little bit. And it's a lot harder. <laughs> I'm going to drop you is what I'm going to do. <laughs> and it becomes a lot harder. I'm going to be sore tomorrow, you know. <clears throat> a weight, thank you, changes everything in your life. Too many Christians are running and they pick up the weights of sin. And it weights them down. And they don't run well. They get wore out. They get tired. They get discouraged. Why? Because they're carrying too much of the weight of this world. If I was to pick up one of these other guys that are bigger, I wouldn't be doing those squats. I might squat once and I wouldn't come back up. <laughs> Why? Because of the weight. One of the things that you go to any doctor and they'll tell you, if you got too much weight yourself, it's hard on your knees. Many times that's why it's hard to go up and down steps. It's hard on your ankles and your body. Well, it's the same way if we talk about the sin of this world. In running a race for the Lord, the sin and the things of this world, the world itself, can become too much weight. You can take something that is good, that there's no really sin in it, and it can become a weight that hinders your running for the Lord. Say, what do you mean? I like to fish. But let's say that I put so much effort into fishing, I begin to neglect my Bible. I begin to ne neglect my prayer life. I begin to neglect telling others about Jesus Christ. And it's all about fishing. Guess what? Something that is not a sin becomes a weight in my life. And it hinders my race for the Lord. It hinders how I perform for God. We need to shed those weights. Now, is it wrong to, to fish? Absolutely not. Is it wrong to do some of these other things? Absolutely not. But when they become a weight, when, they, when there's so much of it in your life that it hinders you from running the race for the Lord and putting Him first in your life, then it becomes a hindrance and it will mess up your race and keep you from running for the Lord like you ought to. People are in the grandstands, you might say, watching us. All around you, I don't care who you are. You've got family members, you've got neighbors, you got co-workers, you got friends. You've got people you don't even know that are watching your race. It might be at the Y. It might be at the grocery store. It might be at Walmart. I walked into a place of business the other day and I need to pick up something and they had it reserved for me. And I said, I'm, I'm Rodney Haggett, and I'm here to pick up this and this. And, and it shocked me. The lady stood up. She said, can I shake your hand? And I thought, I don't even know you. And she says, I listen to your men's word on the radio every day. Amen. And she said, I want to thank you for it. She talked about discussing it with others. 
Now, I didn't know her. There's people in your life that you don't know or around your life that are watching your race. And it's important how we run. It's important how we run. Oh, what a terrible thought to think that we would get sidetracked with all the things of this world and ruin the testimony for Jesus Christ. Paul said that in writing, here he, he, he speaks of, he says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth the easily, so easily beset us. He said, lay those things aside. Paul also said when writing uh, to the people in the church of Philippi in Philippians chapter 3, he says, verse 13 and 14, he said, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Can I tell you something? We've all got things in our past. We've all got things where we've messed up. We've all got those things that we can carry around as baggage. First thing you need to do, you need to make it right with the Lord. 1 John 1 9. But then shed that stuff and begin to run your race, press toward the mark for the, high, uh, for the prize of the high calling of Jesus Christ. Get your focus on Him and run. Paul knew what it was. He knew in his own life the weights that had beset him before. And now he's running for the Lord. He says, I'm forgetting those things. I'm putting them out of my life. And too many Christians quit pressing toward the mark and they just sit down in the race. So how can we run? How can we finish this race as a winner? You see, I don't want to be one of those that run in vain. I want my life to matter. I want my life to count. I don't want it to be just something that is wasted. When I came here, going to be 10 years in July, I told the deacons when I was talking to them, I said, now when I come, if I come, I said, I'm not coming to play games. So we've got to do everything we can to reach souls. And I want that to be my life, that I don't want to waste it. I don't want to take it for granted. Every one of us has a certain amount of time, and we don't know how much it is. So we need to use it and not waste it. It would be so easy sometimes to say, oh, I'll... I'll do that, Lord, later. I'll, I'll talk to them later. I'll, I'll try to get closer to God later. I just want to kind of sit back and take it easy and, and just kind of float. I don't know how many people in here, I'm originally from down southeast Missouri, we've got rivers. God made rivers with, you can see the bottom end, not all this muddy water. And we would do, go on what we call float trips. We would, some of those float trips would be fishing trips and, and we would float with the river and we would fish the banks, catch fish. And sometimes it would be in canoes and we would just go canoeing on, on a canoe float for the, for the teenagers. As when I was a youth pastor, we do that every year. And it was, also, it was so nice a lot of times that on, on part of the river, you couldn't do it on all of it, but on part of the river, had a good movement to it and you could just put the paddle uh, across your lap and just sit there and just enjoy it, sit back. Folks, that's not the way the Christian life is. Because to be honest with you, you're not floating if you're living for God. You're paddling upstream. You're going against the current. You're going against the wiles of the devil. You're going against the things of the world. You're going against the attacks of Satan in your life. You're going against your own flesh. And so you have to work at it to stay uh, active for the Lord. You can't just float. So we need to be active uh, uh, and not wasting our lives by trying to float through the Christian life. We're in a race and we must run. I don't want to run in vain. As I said there in Philippians 2.16, he said, Hold forth the word of life. 
that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. The most important thing in my life and what should be in your life is not the things of this world. They're short-lived. But the most important thing should be the things of Christ. Living for Jesus Christ. Winning lost souls. Lifting up and magnifying the Lord. Glorifying Him. And letting the others see Jesus Christ in your heart and life. Otherwise, life is in vain. We need to be that one that lives for the Lord. So I've got to focus my life. If I'm going to run this race for the Lord... I must focus my life on living and running for Jesus Christ. There we read in Hebrews chapter 12, again verse 2, he says, Looking unto Jesus, the author, otherwise the one who's writing the life, and the finisher, the one at the finish line of our faith. He's the author and finisher that we're to follow after. He's that author, uh, the beginning of the race. He saved me. He led me. He kept me. He provided for me. He's the finisher of, all, of it all also. He's the he's one that will one day uh, uh, bring me through. He's the one that, uh, that is my Savior. He is my judge also. And I will stand before him. He's the author of your faith and the finisher of it. If you will allow him to be the one that leads you. Philippians 1 6 says, Being confident of this very thing, that he, talking about Jesus, which hath begun a good work in you, that was salvation, we are his workmanship, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So we need to look unto him for strength, for guidance, direction. For forgiveness, for faith, for power to overcome sin. You see, he's my shelter in the storm. He's my rope and my strength to climb the mountains that I'm going to face. He's my bridge to cross the swollen tides. He's the shade to uh, protect me from the heat. He's the light in the darkness. He's the, the guide through the wilderness. He's my comfort and friend in the valley. He's my shield and protector from the enemy. Jesus, he's the one that I'm to look to. Not to my abilities, not to what I want and not to what this world wants, but looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Tomorrow when you start your day, I hope you remember this. I hope you remember that he's the author. He gave you the day. He started the day. Don't just start the day with him. Finish the day with him. When you pull that head before you close those eyes, uh, have a good talk with him. And as I said this morning, why don't you just love all over him and, and love him and, and, and brag on him and lift him up in your heart and life and thank him. Here's how to look unto Jesus, an author, finisher of our faith. We look unto him and his word. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. We're to look unto the word of God. You know, if you're going on a trip, I've never, I've never seen any of these, these long races that they have, but they have to have something to guide them on the race. They mark out a path. In fact, if you go to some of these cross countries, where, where Charles? Charles does, has done the cross country and stuff. Do they just go out there and run, Charles? There's a path marked, isn't there? They have it marked off somehow. It may be with, with that uh, uh, chalk paint or it may be with cones or it may be cer certain people standing and maybe all of them pointing you the direction to go or signs or whatever it, it is. I've been to some of those cross-country races taking the kids there on the school bus and I see markers and things. You say, do you walk through the rest? No, I stay up here where it's cool. I'm not going to get in all, all that stuff. <laughs> They're young. Let them run. Amen. But the path is marked out. The path is marked out. Here's the guide. It's been marked out with God's word. The race that you and I are to run. And the reason he gives us his word is, show, is so that there would be no doubt in where we're to run, who we're to run for, and how we're to run. 
So he gives us the Word of God. If you want to run the race for the Lord Jesus Christ, pick up the manual. Pick up the guide. Pick up the map. Find the direction that God is leading and guiding in your life. Also, if we are to run this race for Him, to look unto Him, we look unto Him in prayer. One of the greatest tools each of us have is the ability to pray, to talk with God. And by the way, He wants you to. He wants you to. Jeremiah 33 3 says, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. In this race, there's things before us that we don't know what's out there. And He does. And He will show us if we'll walk with Him in prayer. We're to look unto Him by, by, by and through the Holy Spirit of God. As the Holy Spirit of God dwells within us, what know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own, for you've been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and spirit, which are God's. And we're to listen to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. You know, we all, almost all of us anymore carry that cell phone on our side or in our pocket or in your purse or whatever. And I know that a lot of times when driving for school functions and stuff, going to different places, that I don't know where those places are. And they'll take you to Kansas City. They'll take you here. They'll take you there. And sometimes the teachers don't even know where it is. But if I can get an address, I'll punch it up on my, my, my phone and that GPS on that phone. And I stick an earbud in my ear and, and I take off driving. And there's a voice. I thought it was kind of ironic, Brother Randy, that the voice is a lady's voice. They're always telling us how to drive anyways. <laughs> There's a voice that says, in two miles, take exit so-and-so. You get a little closer so you get over in the right lane. And step by step, it will lead you through. And sometimes when we go into the traffic in places in Kansas City, and there'll be construction. They'll say there's construction ahead. Take such and such exit and takes you around it. In your life, there's the Holy Spirit of God that says there's construction up ahead. You need to be routed around it. Yes. There's the problems ahead. You need to take this route to avoid the problems. Oh, how we need to listen to the Holy Spirit of God that speaks to our hearts and guides us and directs us. He is, he is uh, oh, uh, at, at every moment, He is awake and He is there and He wants us to listen to Him. He wants to guide our lives. He wants to direct us. He wants to show us the right way to go. He wants to help us in this race of life. The Holy Spirit of God is there to guide us. Yes. And we're to look also to, unto the Lord, who's the author and finisher of our faith, in and by faith. There's a lot of things in life in the race that you're about to take or that you are in that doesn't make sense. Did everybody, many times will say, don't do that, don't go this way, don't go that direction, don't do this, don't do that. But by faith, God says, I want you to trust me. I want you to step out by faith. I want you to take this step in the race. I want you to do this. I want you to do that. And we're to trust him by faith. Well, I'll tell you what, there's a lot of things going on, you know, with this building and all that going on that it's by faith. By faith. But also believe it's a time for you and I to grow in faith and trust God. Over, over this period of time, there's been times that, and from the very beginning, before we, even, before we even purchased land, before we did all that stuff, praying and seeking God. And some of the stuff didn't make sense. And God began to open the doors and said, just trust me. Trust me. There's been some of the things, and I'm just going to be 100% honest with you. There's been a few times that I've said, Lord, did I mess up? Did I miss it somewhere? I, I prayed. You gave me peace. You gave me direction. You opened these doors and everything. But, Lord, did I mess up? And then almost, there's been a few times, almost within the hour, he shows me something and does something. Sometimes it's been a phone call. Sometimes it's been something else. He said, see, you can trust me. Amen. And changes the whole picture. But if there's no obstacles, there's no need of faith in the race. In your life, if there's no obstacles, there's no need in faith. You're going to come to some mountains that you don't think that you can climb. 
you're going to come to some roadblocks that you don't think that you can get around. The Lord says, I want you to run by faith and listen to my voice. Trusting. We're in a race. We're in a race. And that race requires us to look unto the author and finisher of our faith. Keeping our eyes on him and not on this world. And as we go through, one day I want to hear those words. But Randy, I'm waiting for those words. Yes. Enter in, thou good and faithful servant. That's right. I want to hear that. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many. I want to know that I've run this life not in vain, but in such a way that Jesus Christ is magnified in the race that I run. That's what I want to see. You see in these NASCAR races and even in sometimes in, in some of the other races, there will be logos and different things on maybe their uniforms or on the cars that is advertising whatever. Can I tell you something? As a Christian, there ought to be a logo. There ought to be a sign. If you're running for the Lord, that they can say that's a Christian and they love God. Run the race that's set before you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you if we love you. Thank you for the opportunity to run a race and to run it in such a way that Jesus Christ is the author and the finisher of that race. Help us to look unto him. May we not run this race of life in vain, but may every part of our lives be to bring honor to bring glory unto Jesus Christ. That souls might be saved. That Christians might be encouraged. And Lord, that we might magnify you. Have your will way this invitation. Lord, maybe some need to come tonight and say, Lord, I've been carrying a lot of weight and laid at the altar. It may not be sin, but there may be other things. But it's weighting them down. Or maybe some come tonight and say, I've got my eyes off the race. I need to get my eyes back on Jesus Christ. There may be some even here tonight to say, I'm a church member, been baptized, but I'm not really saved. And Lord, may they receive Christ as their Savior tonight. Have your will and way in the invitation. Strengthen us. Help us to trust you. Help us to, to follow the voice the Holy Spirit and the Word of God and, and run by faith trusting you helps to overcome those mountains those difficult times those roadblocks to bring honor and glory to your name for this I pray in Jesus name for his honor for his glory Amen